There you go. All right. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Pastor Drew Ingram. I should, Drew, I guess I should change my name on my screen. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll just leave that on there. Um, anyway, I'm not Deacon Ryan Hostler. I'm actually um, Pastor Mark Bernthal. Let me change that. I should have done that before we got on there. But as I'm changing this name, I am thrilled to have Drew join us. Drew was the pastoral intern, or as we called him, Vicar Drew, at St. Armand's in Sarasota in 2014 to 2015. Uh, and it was my just joy to, uh, to be uh, the supervisor at that time. Uh, Drew was uh, intern number three. Um, and uh, anyway, I don't want to tell them all about you. Drew, I want to invite you to share a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Good to be with you today and with all the wonderful folks um, out in Bureau Beach. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm Pastor Drew Ingram, served with Mark uh, as a pastoral intern at St. Armand's Key 2014-15. I'm now the pastor at Spirit in the Hills Lutheran Church in Spicewood, Texas, uh, which is kind of just west, southwest of the city of Austin, uh, which is where I grew up and was born, um, went to seminary out on the East Coast in Columbia, South Carolina, Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary. That's how I ended up um, encountering Pastor Mark uh, through the internship program there. And after I finished up, ended up back in Central Texas. And that was summer of 2016. So I just celebrated four years of ordained ministry and four years as the pastor at Spirit in the Hills. Um, the congregation, just a little bit more about us. So we're, like I said, we're kind of just west of the western suburbs, of the southwestern suburbs of Austin. Um, we have been a worshiping community since 2008. Uh, we have been out of mission development as a congregation since 2015, so shortly before I arrived. Um, small but growing congregation and um, like all of us right now, learning how to do things a little bit differently uh, in this time of coronavirus, but thankful to be with you all. And um, what a joy this is to join you for Bible study in this way. Yeah. And maybe most importantly, um, your lovely family. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I am. Uh, I have a wife named Lee and uh, she is a teacher and we have two kids. Uh, we have a daughter who will be three in November named Lily and our son Derek just turned one a month ago. Um, so two little ones that keep us busy and I don't I've heard from some of my congregation members that they're bored at times during all of this. Uh, my house is never boring. In fact we're just really tired if we're not um, really excited and having a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I'll bet. So uh, that's, that's so exciting. Um, I will look forward to the day to be able to meet Derek and Lily in person. Um, and we'll pray that the, that time might come sooner rather than later with all of this COVID cloud uh, hanging over all of us. Um, so one of the things I know that uh, our congregations are doing, like congregations across the spectrum, um, we're all praying for each other. Uh, but it is amazing to see uh, how the church continues, how it strengthens in some ways. And, um, uh, and I'm excited to share this time with you. A couple really quick fun facts, um, for me anyway. Uh, I got to preach at Drew's ordination four years ago. Uh, that was a highlight and a ministry moment. Uh, for me, um, at a beautiful, what I would call cathedral church in, in Austin. And, um, and the other thing is I've always joked around with some truth that uh, I go, Drew's kind of responsible for me being here in Vero Beach. Um, there was a time uh, when Drew finished his internship, went back for his last year, as that last year went on at the seminary. Um, we did a little bit of dreaming together, maybe visioning about the possibility of partnering in ministry uh, and finding a path maybe to bring 
Drew as, uh, as, as pastor to uh, share with me in Sarasota. And um, about the time that we were going to pull the trigger, uh, Drew was approached about this mission development work going on in Austin. And uh, anyway, I can still remember the conversation and he's like going, but I, but I made a commitment to you. <laughs> I said, well, our, both of our commitments are to God. So let's have that conversation. And I said, by the way, there is this one congregation on the other coast of Florida that said that, you know, would I think about this or consider? And I go, I'll always wonder. And I go, you will too. And so let's pursue that. And what did it take about a week? And I think we kind of both knew the direction that, uh, that God was pulling. So, uh, so anyway, that's it, right. We, it would have been really good though. <laughs> of course. <laughs> anyway. uh, we, we, we make all these, uh, dreams and, and nothing wrong with dreams is sometimes the Holy Spirit's dreams are a little different than ours. So, yeah, well, you know, one of the dreams of the Holy Spirit is that we would learn the way of forgiveness and that is really our uh, theme in our uh, Bible study this week. I'm trying to look to do a screen share, but um, for some reason, my sheet is not coming up, which is fine. Drew, do you have the sheet in front of you? I do. Let me see if I can. I don't know if you can share or you are so yeah. silly. This is why these young people need to be. <laughs> Here, let me do this. Uh, all right. So, Drew, would you mind reading the, uh, the Matthew text for us? I would be happy to. Um, yeah, so this is the Holy Gospel according to Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not? have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Um, well, we'll get to the parable part of that. Um, which I don't know about you, but at first I kind of liked the parable, but the ending of it, and I'm like going like, wow, that's Matthew for you. <laughs> that's what I say. Matthew's gospel is really good at that. You're like, yeah, I'm in it. I'm in it. Whoa, that's really scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Weeping and gnashing of the teeth and all that good kind of stuff. It's like, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah. So 
let's just go ahead and put it out there. Remember, parables don't always line up as allegories, and so let's not make the mistake of thinking that the Lord here represents God. <laughs> so, um, just just throw that out there at the beginning. Uh, yeah. But we'll get there. Um, uh, Drew, you want to go ahead and just go ahead and take that off the screen and let's sure. just have the conversation. Um, yeah. But uh, so really kind of there is the parable, but uh, the parable comes in response to this question that 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 Peter asked. Um, if a member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? So the first thing that kind of hit me on that was like, I, is, is there some just some honesty here to go like, um, you know, you would think that things like that wouldn't happen in church, but they do. Um, and there is conflict uh, within communities of faith, like there's conflict in the world. So, uh, you know, I just kind of on the Bible study sheet asked a quick question to go, have you ever been part of a community of faith where there was conflict? Um, on a Sunday, if you asked the people who were worshiping with you, pretend you're back in person and you've got a couple hundred people. How many people do you think would raise their hand on that one? It's, well, you know, it's hard to say. I think if we're being honest, like I think Peter is trying to be in this, we probably all have experienced conflict within the church. You know, that, like you mentioned, there's conflict. When we try to live together, um, conflict arises. And, uh, and, I would say, though, I, I've also been in plenty of settings in the church where nobody wants to talk about the conflict, like that our, our address towards conflict being there is to sort of just let it be. Um, and, uh, and that's, you know, last week's gospel lesson that leads right into this one and, and this one as well, um, are not leaving room for that. Like one of the things it seems certainly Jesus is challenging his people, uh, his followers to, to do is to to be honest and to engage those things and try and work through them. Um, yeah. So thanks for reminding us that, uh, you know, the, just, just before this passage uh, is, is kind of this model of how in the church we might want to address conflict, you know, to deal with it kind of directly by going to the person first. And if that doesn't work, what do you do? take a few people with you and it's all like really good advice, isn't it? Of course, here we go with Matthew again, it's kind of like, and if that doesn't work, then you try this, but if that doesn't work, then you just treat them like a Pharisee or a Gentile or a tax collector. So. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I do find a little bit of hope in there because uh, lest we were so good at just focusing on some of those verses, you know, Jesus brings the tax collectors and the Gentiles in. Jesus goes out to them and, and feeds them. So while the relationship might change, which is what I see there, right? It may not be the right. exact same relationship as you have with another, you know, member of the church, um, if you will. But it's not that uh, that somebody's entirely cut off and, and sent away out there. Yeah. So uh, I was, I actually took a weekend off, took a week off just to kind of do nothing. I did, did get to sneak down to the Keys where my son is staying for a week. Uh, I took Mary down there and, and we both learned how to lobster dive a little bit or snorkel. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, but I was off the weekend and that's exactly one of the directions where the Pastor Nicole took the sermon here. You probably preached on this, that text last Sunday. And, and I like, I, I, th that's such an important reminder um, that, yeah, treat them like a tax collector or a Gentile. If you think about it, Jesus treated them very lovingly. Um, and remember that Matt, this is Matthew, after all, right. the disciples' gospel, who was what? The tax collector. But it also seems to me that Peter must have understood that, that it wasn't a matter of kind of like three strikes and you're out. Because Peter's like going, so, okay, I get all of this, I think, but like, how, is it a forever kind of a thing? How many, how many times? Um, right. Yeah. If, if it's not three strikes, is it 20? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, three is kind of a lot of strikes. Um, right. Yeah. Way, but, uh, 
So I don't know. Do you kind of get the sense that Peter is, is he looking for a loophole? You know, what's, what's behind Peter's question? I, um, I'm not sure if, if it's exactly a loophole he's looking for. I think definitely it could be. Um, I hear something that I hear in a lot of uh, encounters with Jesus in the gospel is like, he's trying to figure out like the exact thing he needs to do. Um, so maybe it's a loophole. Maybe it's like, you know, at what point can I stop forgiving? Um, or maybe it's like, no, no, no. What's the right number that then I've like satisfied everything that needs to be satisfied that I've done my, my part and, you know, fulfilled all righteousness. I think of, uh, the, of getting ready for the, you know, um, when Jesus is approached by, uh, the, the man who wants to know, you know, what he needs to do to get into heaven and Luke's gospel. And he responds with the parable of the Samaritan, the same thing's happening there, right? Like, okay. You know, he knows the answer. I need to, I need to love my name. I need to love God with everything I have um, and everything that I am. And I need to love my neighbor as myself. And Jesus is like, yeah, you got it right. And, uh, and he's like, okay, but who's my neighbor, right? Like, and, and it's that same thing, like maybe looking for a loophole, but also like really, really concerned with getting it exactly right, doing exactly what he needs to do, like totally focused on the, the specific actions rather than sort of what the the underlying ethos right like the the way of life sure. that, that Jesus seems to be pointing to so instead of um, you know instead of saying like oh yeah I just engage in this process sort of as many times as it takes because I'm called to show mercy and forgive uh, Peter's like okay all right I get it forgive people how many times <laughs> Right. Like, and, and I think, you know, it takes me back to Luther and, and, you know, works and we're so good at making things, you know, something we have to do. (laughs) There's kind of like a legalism that's involved, but it's not a legalism that's looking to get out of the law or minimize the law, but it's like the law's good. And and I want to follow it because I want to be good. Yeah, it's a it's a trying to earn his own righteousness in a way, right? Like, yeah. tell me, tell me what I need to do. And yeah. sometimes I feel this way too, right? It's like, just give me exactly what I need to do, make it clean and simple, and I can do it. And and then I know, I know what my task is. I know how I have to go. And and Jesus leaves room for, hey, you know, the scenarios might be all over the place, right? Because when we're together in conflict, you know, a lot of things can happen. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe that helps us understand um, why Jesus tells the parable that he does tell, because we'd we'd like to be able to get it right and count it. And so we could kind of document it and show our righteousness and those kinds of things. Um, uh, Jesus tells his parable, which is kind of crazy in some ways, which is true to form for Jesus' parable telling. where you give this, you know, uh, whole idea of someone being forgiven really an amount that is too large to even comprehend. Um, and so, you know, I, I put some of that, I hope my math was close to being right. Um, but it's like, you know, 20 years worth of, 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 of labor that this king is forgiving, which is just like, who would do that? Um, And, uh, but then of course, uh, the one who is forgiven uh, the debt goes out and uh, and really for a small amount of money that is owed to him, uh, reacts very differently to that person and has them thrown in jail uh, and all the rest of that. so, and then the response of that, which we can deal with in a second, but one of the questions I put on the sheet is kind of like, um, so in parables, we always know that it's very often that Jesus is exaggerating to make a point. And, and so he's, he's really using the exaggeration, I think here in terms of the size of the debt and then the smaller amount. Um, uh, the exaggerated response between the, the king and then the one who is forgiven, who has not learned what forgiveness is. Um, what, what do you find, Drew, more surprising that, 
the Kings forgiving that exaggerated sum or the behavior of the forgiven servant slave? That's a good question. Um, I think that uh, probably more surprising for me is the um, more surprising is that the King would forgive this great, great sum, right? Like it's, um, it's, it's so much, you're right. I think, um, you know, the, the idea here in this parable, I think is similar to Jesus response, um, to Peter of like, you know, seven times 70, uh, you know, or 77, right? Like the idea is not necessarily even just like the math. It's like, Hey, think like huge, think this really big number. So Jesus is laying out this parable. Like this guy has a debt that like you cannot pay back, especially if you consider the position, his starting position as a slave of this master um and uh and so it's it's surprising too because i think we often look at people who are in um positions as like kings right and rulers and decision makers the people in authority uh, the people who you know have done the lending uh and are expecting repayment and the typical, uh, you know, attributes and characteristics that we would apply to people in that situation um, are not what the what this king exhibits at the beginning, right? Like that. It, so it's it's surprising that he would show mercy in this way. That he would completely wipe out this debt. Not you know, it's not even like okay, you know, I'll reduce the interest rate or you know, I'll forgive a portion. It's like complete and total forgiveness of this. And the re- the only reason I say that it's not that surprising that then the person who's received that kind of forgiveness goes and, and doesn't offer it and, uh, and doesn't exemplify it is I've seen that too often. I could even kind of point to my own life um, that I'm not resting in the forgiveness I've received and instead I'm, I'm holding somebody accountable for something um, that it, that I shouldn't be expecting them to pay me. Um, yeah. I, I hear you when I, when I first, thought about that question I'm like going boy they're both surprising and Mm -hmm. and when I thought about the you know the unforgiving uh uh servant I thought you know that's 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 ridiculous how how could that person not do that and the more I thought about that I thought well you know it's human nature and it's my nature (laughs) right do and so it's like be careful because you shake the finger you know because it's coming right back at you um, or, or we even you know i think of we have short-term memory sometimes right like we have so like yeah. he's he's maybe even just forgotten like what he's come from and he's just you know i could say he's maybe even he's acting how we would expect somebody who's owed a debt to act mm-hmm. he wants the debt paid right the king was the one acting in the way that was unexpected um but but the reality is he was supposed to live that unexpected way because of what he had received. Yeah. So th- there's this, there's this phrase that we pray repeatedly in the Lord's prayer that comes to mind um, because, you know, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And I'm like going, obviously this dude did not heard the Lord's prayer yet. <laughs> right well yeah oh. and, i mean i think about how uh though this, this text the same thing was in my head the same line and i i think about how um intense that line is that we pray so often right um that like what we're asking yeah. for is uh yeah. that that <laughs> phrase that phrase maybe maybe more than any other in the lord's prayer has stopped me cold dead in my tracks on many many occasions um you know um and so it's in the lord's prayer you know we have the whole sermon on the mount in 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 matthew this this whole teaching on forgiveness is not something new to matthew 18 the way of the church the way of the community is the way of christ and it's the way of followers and we get it all over the place um but uh it, it is not easy and 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 maybe that's why this parable is just not easy because there is this other part of the parable where it's kind of like at the end of the day, the king is kind of, okay, forgive me my debts as I forgive those. 
I yeah. was kind of like, well, okay, if you're going to do that. But you said something earlier that really caught my ear, Drew. Um, when you talked about the surprise, um, being more surprised that the king would forgive this debt because you said it was a debt that you could not pay back. I mean, like, even if you wanted to, you couldn't pay it back. So, so is, is that what God is expecting? It, it seems to me, no, that's not what God is expecting for us to pay it back. But I do think we are to pay it forward. Um, and in beginning in the community of faith, because again, I think one of the things we look at in here, you know, the whole question, let's not forget, is Peter is going, if a member of the church, so, so these are people we're in relationship with, right? Or supposed to be. And um, uh, so there is this idea of, of, of expectation, I think, of, of paying it forward. Um, but that gummit, it's just not easy, you, you know? Um, yeah, I, Jesus, Jesus seems to have some pretty high expectations of his followers. Um, and, you know, we, we could go back to the Sermon on the Mount at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel and, you know, the, the, the points, the highlights that he hits on of, you know, he sort of strengthens the law, we say, right? Like, he, you've heard it said this, but I tell you, like, hey, even the smaller thing is also that. Um, and, and these texts about forgiveness, like are some really, it seems like some really high expectations of what his followers, the way his followers ought to be living. And, and that's intimidating. Like almost impossible. Um, mm -hmm. so a couple of thoughts there for, for me, one is, I guess the, 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 the rest and the good news that we find is that it is God's forgiveness, unlike the king in this parable, quite honestly, God's forgiveness promises that it has the last word. Um, uh, that doesn't give us the excuse to like, oh, well, then I don't have to try quite as hard, you know. Um, but to know that we can risk doing uh, what God is calling us to do through Christ um, uh, without fear of oh my God, we've got to get it perfect, which would put us in Peter's shoes going like, okay, I got to make sure I'm going to get it right. So how many times, uh, you, you know, seven times, is that enough? <laughs> so, right. Yeah. That's like two and a half outs almost when you think of strikes, but um, uh, it, yeah, it's, it, there's something about, um, I think that, that what Jesus is, is trying to convey is um, the spirit, spirit in which you are forgiving is more is more important than the number of times like and uh and and that means like having that that spirit of forgiveness is uh is going to make you you know i think of uh you know if let's take 77 right if if everybody that i'm you know that my relationship is broken with, if I have to forgive all of them 77 times, I'm going to lose track really quick. Like I'm pretty good with spreadsheets. I was an accounting major in undergrad. I'm still going to lose track um, of how many times I've forgiven or not forgiven. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, that's what that, that to me is, is a little bit of what's going on here. Like think about um, the way in which you have been forgiven and, and therefore the way in which the spirit in which you are, you're in, supposed to forgive and and therein lies the good news for me of you know that spirit of forgiveness is originates with god and is given into us and and motivates us through it and is there when we inevitably mess it up again yeah so um gosh there's so many other things that that, that we could hit on and talk about um but, but maybe the simplest thing is just to ask and ponder the question for a minute or two. What is forgiveness? Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, um, to, to, to forgive somebody. Um, so one of the commentaries I was, was reading um, went back and really looked at uh, the different Hebrew words for forgiveness and it kind of started there and, I didn't get a whole lot further than that, um, but uh, but for me, it kind of helped me think of forgiveness as 
you know, because we throw these phrases out sometimes, like, you know, for to, to forgive and forget does, you know, I forgive you, but I'm never going to forget. Um, is, is forgetting part of that? I, I don't think it is. Um, I don't think it's in our capacity. Maybe divine forgiveness can do that, but I don't think human forgiveness can can do that. Uh, another phrase that's out there is uh, kind of, well, you can, you, you, you can forgive the, the person, but not the sin, the sinner, but not the sin. And, and, you know, we get that, but it has some problematic kinds of things involved in that too. Um, yeah. Uh, no, you, I, you know, to, 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 to err is human, to forgive is divine. And so we're not quite measurable. You get all that kind of stuff. But as I was contemplating that, the, the in, in Hebrew, I think the most dominant idea is that forgiveness is to, to let go of something. Um, uh, even more so than it is to erase it. Um, although that can be part of it. But... It, it's it's the letting go of that. Uh, so letting go of the uh, of the offense um, to you to the community, and because without letting go of it, it almost seems like it's impossible to find a path forward. And I really think behind all of this is, you know. Anyway, I think this Sunday I'm going to tie it to the Old Testament reading, which is uh, Joseph, you know, whose brothers sold him into slavery, threw him in the pit, that whole story. Um, but years later, it comes back to bite them someplace, and they have to go to Joseph. And uh, Joseph has already actually forgiven them once um, when we reached this point um, in, in Genesis. But... Um, they but didn't know it was him that. yet. <laughs> What's that? They didn't know it was him yet. He forgave yeah. them, but like he they didn't them, understand they didn't what was it. happening. Yeah. And so, but now they know it and they're like going like, oh my gosh, you know, this is like come back to haunt us and all the rest of that. And their first thought is something that I think is really natural. It's like, he's going to hold a grudge against us. Uh, somehow Joseph found a way to, to let it go that doesn't mean that what they did was right. In fact, God, they did it for wrong. Somehow, God has turned that into something that is going to. There's going to be some tremendous good uh, in the in the saving of Israel again through this. And um, I I can't imagine it was easy for Joseph though. Yeah, no, I've it. Uh... I think of um, they mentioned in the in his previous encounters with his brothers, and even in that one, like that he's teary. And you could go like, "Oh, is he like sentimental about seeing this family? Is he angry about like here they are? Here are the people that you know ruined my life. Is he considering that like the terrible things happened, but the but now he's in this." you know, great position and able to help out not only his family, but so many others. Um, and, and I think probably yes. Uh, and all of that emotion tied up in, in what was going on, that it would be so hard to, to say, um, to, to live out that forgiveness, to, to make that claim that while you intended it for evil, God has used it for good. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, um, I think it had to have been really hard, which is when, um, you know, that phrase you said to air is human to forgive divine. That's where I see that in there of like the, I think the only spark that really enables some him to truly forgive that or any of us to, to really live into that forgiveness is the divine forgiveness that comes to us is the, the, the presence of God with us and in us. Yeah. Well, you know, so I don't want to let you go without asking you, how do you deal with Matthew and the end of the parable? Yeah. Um, there's a couple of things that come to mind. So one, um, I don't think it's a, does he, does he mention fire in this one? I don't uh, think so. 
Yeah, um, no. But he oh. does in a lot of them. And so one of the things that we've been doing a Bible Orchard. study. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he mentions <laughs> torture. He does mention torture. Yes, I see that. Um, so I, uh, in a lot of them, there's like, there's, there's fire, there's discomfort, there's torture, there's, uh, you know, gnashing of teeth and tears and weeping. Um, a couple of things going on. One, we've been doing a Bible study on Isaiah uh, through the summer. And um, I think of Isaiah's call story. This is in Isaiah 6. And uh, he's encountering God, like he's in the presence of the divine. And there's these heavenly creatures singing, holy, holy, holy. And one of them comes to him with this burning hot coal. And Isaiah has this recollection of like, oh, no, I'm, I'm complicit in the sin of my society. I am a sinner. I stand no chance. I'm going to be burned up and consumed in flame. And what happens when the coal is pressed on him is that uh, it's a purifying flame. It's a refining flame. It actually um, doesn't consume him. It transforms him. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that, that piece of imagery, um, I, I think does hold, and you know, Matthew is really fond of quoting Isaiah uh, as he tells this story, but this idea that um, there, you know, I think even, you know, like, the weeds are cut off and thrown into the burning fire uh, and all of this. I think of the, um, the reality of, of death and resurrection. Uh, I think of the, the purifying and life giving qualities of flame uh, in addition to those that aren't. Um, but, but you have some like this where, yeah, you, you, it, you'll be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. Um, the the thing that seems to win out in all of these, uh, the thing that seems exemplified in the life of Christ as well as his death and resurrection, um, is that capacity to forgive um, in fullness. And so we we get these passages again and again and again. And I think one we have to sort of sit with them and let them make us uncomfortable for a little while. Um, because I think similarly to the Sermon on the Mount, they're really convicting because you go like, oh man, I didn't give the forgiveness that I received. Um, I've been in that situation. This is, this is not some small thing. You know, we talked about, uh, you mentioned being forgiven and knowing that God's forgiveness is what, you know, holds out at the end of the day. Um, could, we could take that to mean like, oh, nothing matters. Um, right. Like I can do whatever I want to and I'll be forgiven. Um, and I think Jesus is saying, Hey, that's not actually the case. And so what I see in some of these is, um, like there are going to be some dire consequences for not living out God's ways. And you might experience some of those now because God is inviting you to live in this abundant and eternal life that starts now and goes on forever. And when you're not, when you're, when you're not forgiving one another, um, that stuff eats away at you, right? Like that, um, like you mentioned, right? If you're like holding on to that grudge, it can be hard that's, that's to do torture. anything else, right? So, so I think, you know, Jesus is, is pointing to this truth of when we're not living in God's ways, there are, there are consequences that come to bear often by our own doing, right? Just as Joseph's brothers intended for evil and some evil did happen like bad things happen to joseph at the end of the day god brings good right um so so i love that story alongside this one the lectionary is doing the right thing you know by holding these together and and i love that you know you're heading that direction for the sermon i might too um and you know i don't have the, the benefit of multiple staff i'm still working you know my sermons don't get done uh i've got to preach every week um no uh but the the idea of kind of holding that together of like yeah there there is there you'll be tortured by by not living into this that's the torture um, you know matthew the weeping and gnashing of the teeth i mean you know i i, I know there have been you know moments more than i would care to admit um in periods in my own life where you know that teeth grinding at night um just you, you know when the tears come pretty quickly where there is you just kind of feel like you're in a state of discontent um, torture whatever we want to call that um and you know usually we're not finding a path forward during that um 
entered this whole notion of, 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 of forgiveness, of letting go of, and I don't want to sound cliche about it because there's a lot of hard work involved in it. Um, and, and in no way is Jesus telling this parable or do we want to uh, moralize the story of Joseph and his brothers to say that no matter what you have to forgive other people, you, you know, I mean, to find a path forward, um, uh, to be able to forgive yourself, to be able to, to try to have some understanding and, and, and love for enemy, it, it does not mean excusing repeated horrible behavior. Right, it's yeah. Part no. of last week's gospel, right? I, I mean, you know, at a certain point, it, it is kind of like a, you know, you may need to distance yourself from a tax collector who's going to continue to cheat. Right. The, uh, uh, or a Gentile who's going to say, no, there's not this one God. There are a bunch of gods, and I choose to worship the sex God. <laughs> you know, all that other kind of stuff is kind of like you can still distance yourself from an abuser. Yes. Yeah. But that's what I was saying. That is, can, but even that can be done out of love for the sake of moving forward um, and, and exposing that. So, um, Yes, now that's that's so important. You know, it's not. I don't think um, though these texts about forgiveness have been used in some of these ways to like tell people to stay in a situation that is abusive. Um, yeah. That's not what's going on here. The the Gentile tax collector thing. You know, the relationship might need to be different. Often it does, right? Because if you for, if forgiveness means going back to the way things were, if the way things were was not good, if it was not life giving and healthy and joyful. Um, then something needs to change. So forgiveness doesn't mean that it, it, it means moving toward something. Right new. relationship that we're trying to restore through forgiveness, mm -hmm. not a systemic, horrible relationship in terms right. of going, well, you know, well, it's all, all's forgiven. Well, um, th that's maybe easy to say, but um, it's not so easy to do when things aren't, aren't changing. So to be called into the hard work, you know, it's kind of like, so again, so how many times do I have to do this? Seven times, 77, which again is an exaggeration. Um, if, if Peter would ask me that question at this point now, I would go, how many times do you have to do it? I don't know until it works. <laughs> um, yeah. And when it's ultimately going to work is when we get even the fullest, more encounter of that in our own lives and in how we experience that. And we, if we really do, then, then I think as natural as it is to want to hold a grudge, when we really experience God's forgiveness, I think it's also a natural response to go like, I can't, I, I, I can't hold that grudge anymore. I can't, I got to let this go. I got to move forward. I've got to share as much as I can, a piece of what God has given, has given to me. Um, well, we're kind of uh, at a time where we need to come to a conclusion. Uh, I do want to say again, Drew, thanks a million. Uh, I miss these conversations. I'm like, me too. Oh, really? So six years ago, it, it, it's, it doesn't seem that long ago um, as we get back into conversation, but share my best with uh with Lee, um, squeeze those kiddos a little extra from someone who they've never met before. <laughs> uh, but from the great folks here in Vero Beach uh, at Our Savior, please uh, share our partnership um, in our joy uh, in our prayers with your congregation. Um, excited. I live vicariously through all of your mission developer stuff. It reminds me of an earlier day um and your energy and the things that you're doing make me tired <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so i really appreciate that um, i'll follow your lead in uh, and get some rest soon that was uh <laughs> you know what people are like going like well what are you doing since you're not having church on sunday i'm like going oh my gosh we're, we're doing <laughs> we're doing all the time so 
Psalm 103 is the appointed psalm for this Sunday. And um, in, instead of closing just with a prayer, I just would like to, to use the psalm because this whole idea of forgiveness and, uh, um, is expressed through all of the readings this Sunday. Uh, but prayerfully, I offer this. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a parent has compassion for their children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For the Lord knows how we are made. He remembers that we are dust. Amen. Amen. God be with you, Drew. Let me and with all of you. Record button here and.